Hi, I'm Dr. Mila Brujic, and I'm joined with Dr. Allison Bozong, where we're going to be talking about ODs in the ER on today's OI show. Dr. Allison Bozong, welcome, and thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Um, if you could just give the audience a little bit of a background on where you went to optometry school, when you graduated, um, kind of some of your residency training, and what you're actually doing now, kind of spending most of your time doing. Yeah, of course. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. I'm super excited um, to be part of it. I feel like I've known about OI ever since working with uh, Dr. Dave Kading at his practice in 2014. So I'm a fan. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's exciting. I went to optometry school at Southern College of Optometry in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I graduated in 2015. After that, I did a residency in ocular disease. So I went to Bascom Palmer for my residency. Um, did that for a year, of course. From there, I actually moved back to the Midwest and uh, went to the University of Iowa and actually worked in their ophthalmology department for about three years. Um, and there I was working pretty much in the cornea subspecialty clinic, which was really fun, doing a lot of medical cornea. And then I also worked in the comprehensive clinic and took all the add-ons. So everyone was like, we need someone to take these patients that are getting add-on or schedules are booked. And so I was kind of that person that stepped into the role, uh, which was really exciting, kind of scary as a first job, um, but really fun and actually primed me for what I ended up doing now, which is, um, you know, after about three years there, I moved back to Miami, Florida, and I'm now at Baskin Palmer again for my second time, second round. What brought you back down to South Florida? Like what was kind of the trigger to say, all right, I'm going to go back and live down like in the Southeast, essentially. Right, right. Yeah, I was kind of like a little ping pong ball for a little bit there. Um, so I would say the weather was one thing, but probably more importantly was my fiance. So he's actually at uh, Baskin Palmer as well. Um, he's a physician here. He does oculoplastic surgery. Um, and so it was either I moved down to Miami or I tried to convince a Southern California guy to move to Iowa. Uh, and that was a little bit of a tougher sell as you'd imagine. So um, I came back and it's it's never, a, you know, working at Baskin Palmer was always kind of in the pipeline potentially for me or, you know, something I'd be excited to do. So I was really glad to have the opportunity to come back. So now t tell, the, tell the group here, like, you probably have one of the most unique practice settings from an optometric perspective that I've heard of in a long time. And and kind of share with the audience too a little bit more about that and, and what your day-to-day -day basis looks like. Yeah, so it is a really unique environment. Um, essentially the day-to-day -day there, you know, my schedule is a little bit variable. So of every week, you know, I work five days a week usually and three of the days I actually spend in our emergency room. So we have an ophthalmic only ER, which is one of the few in the country. Um, it's open 24 seven, you know, the doors never close. You always have someone there to see patients. Uh, and as you'd expect, the hours were, were the busiest or like most ERs. It's going to be during the daytime, kind of the late morning, you know, early afternoon is when everybody comes in with their emergencies. Um, and so I, I just work seeing patients there. And so, you know, these are actually patients that are coming in with all kinds of ophthalmic emergencies, whether it be eye trauma, whether it be sudden vision loss, whether it be pain of the eye, um, you name it, it, it literally comes in. Uh, it's, it's a pretty interesting place. It's very fast paced. So, um, you know, at any given time, you're probably juggling maybe two or three different patients. Maybe one's getting imaging and another one's doing a, you know, lab tests or something like that. So it's, you know, it's a lot to keep track of, but it's always exciting. Well, so so we, Allison, like, you know, when, when you're in a, so I personally, I'm in a primary care setting where I'm taking care of a lot of chronic conditions. We get emergency add-ons, but to give you perspective, like at the beginning of the day, I'll sit down with the technician that I'm working with that day and we'll kind of plan out our day. So we'll go through every single patient and say, yep, this is a regular pretest plus I want an OCT and this on this person. This next person's a dry patient. So make sure that we're getting uh, speed and flamma dry on this patient. So we kind of plan out the day. You don't really get the opportunity to do that because you <laughs> have no clue what your schedule is going to look like when you walk in in the morning. I mean, is that a correct statement that I just shared with you? A hundred percent. So hearing your like day to day gives me a very, a sense of peace. I'm like, that's really, <laughs> really nice. 
Um, but yeah, it's, it would be nice to have that sometimes. And every now and then I do on my, on my clinic days, but generally the ER, I mean, it's, it's like any emergency department, nothing is planned. Nobody, you know, has a scheduled appointment to come in and you never really know what people will come in with. They might have, you know, symptoms of one thing and they have a history of, you know, maybe a vision loss and they have a history of macular generation, but they end up having a mass or a tumor. That was a patient that came in today. Um, and so even if you have a bit of the history, it still doesn't tell you everything, but yeah, we get, you know, whatever testing we need to do on the day that they get there in order to make the diagnosis and come up with a treatment plan, but so it is very what, unscheduled. <laughs> what, what technologies do you have access to in kind of the IER? I mean, do you have OCT technologies available for you? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty fortunate. I work, you know, Monday through Friday, which is when the entire department's everyone's there. We have all of our imagers there and everything. Um, so we have access to whatever we need at the weekends. It's a little bit different. It's pretty much just an ultrasound, um, that they have. Uh, but during the weekdays, you know, you can do OCTs, you can do optic nerve macula. We've got, um, fluorescein angiography, ICGs, you know, OCTAs. We have, you know, anterior segment, uh, high resolution OCT. We've got ultrasounds for the orbit for the eye, the anterior segment, uh, we have an MRI and a CT instrument as well. Um, I, I can't think of anything we don't have as far as imaging that we would potentially need to diagnose something. That's great. So um, this, this is so cool. Um, Allison, I'm going to ask you like to kind of just like, and I know I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to give us like kind of a few cases that were kind of really interesting to you over the last like you know few days to few weeks but um give us kind of a an idea of what what the process looks like patient comes into the er and what does that kind of path look like until they see you and then when they see you kind of what happens with tests that you may need to order at that point yeah that's a great question so when the patient arrives they essentially come into the front desk um, at the emergency department so we're we're within the Baskin Palmer is kind of freestanding building and every floor is a different specialty. So we're, we're on the second floor. Uh, so they come up to us, they check in in the emergency room and then uh, pretty much right away, they'll see one of our triage nurses who is basically the first point of contact from a medical perspective. That nurse is going to go through their vitals. Um, so take their vitals, go through a chief complaint with them and give them what we call an acuity rating. So that would be something ranging from a one to a five. Um, a one would be the most severe, most acute, uh, most dangerous type of thing, potentially. And a five is something that is less dangerous, less acute, less severe. Um, so they're kind of ranged on that scale. And, and that's a tough job, too, I think, trying to pick out, you know, who's who. I was just going uh, to say, Allison, like, I'd have a tough job sometimes doing that with the limited information we sometimes get from people. Yeah. So that's a tough time. Yeah, definitely. So our, our nurses are awesome. I mean, they've been doing this, a lot of them for years and years, and they, they get really good at it. And you can pretty much almost tell from a diagnosis or from a chief complaint and a number, you've got like four main things you're looking for. Um, they're always surprises, but it's kind of funny how that works. But they see them first. Um, and then after that, then they do some more registration. You know, if they have insurance they would like to use and they can, you know, um, get their insurance information to our front desk. But then they see one of the other nurses who work there as well. And they're the ones who really go through more of the medical history, surgical history, um, medications that they might be on. And then they also check the vision, uh, the pupils. They'll take a pressure on the eye if it's safe to do so. And then also if it's safe, then they'll dilate the eye as well. Um, there are a lot of patients that, for one reason or another, can't have a pressure checked or maybe aren't safe to dilate right now or, or need some other kind of testing first. So a lot of times the nurses are... They're very open about coming to any of us doctors and saying, hey, I need someone to do a pupil check on this patient. Maybe, you know, it's a new patient that has an APD um, and they want it to be confirmed by one of the doctors. Uh, or it could be a patient with a pressure of, you know, 45 and they want to make sure that, you know, is it safe to dilate this patient as an angle closure or is it, you know, something like NVG where we need to look in the back and it's not, you know, an appositional closure. 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 Oh my gosh. Appositional closure. Can you edit that part out? <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh yeah, we'll leave it in that. <laughs> we'll leave it in. Okay, great. Yeah, I have some speaking difficulties. Um, so the the second nurse will see them if everything's good to dilate. You know, checks out okay, or uh, you know, or they have a diplopia screen that will come in and check for diplopia and EOMs before they dilate too. 
Um, but then after that, after they've seen the second nurse, then they basically are marked as waiting for a provider. And so at that point, um, they kind of get in a queue essentially of being ready to see the doctor. And so that's when any of us can jump in um, and, and pull the patient back to see them. Great. So, so with that said, Allison, like um, share with us like one or two kind of things in the past, like few days, a few weeks where you're like, this was, this was kind of cool. And it kind of caught me off guard just a little bit. Yeah, definitely. So I was, I'm thinking of one that came in, was it yesterday? I think it was yesterday. I can't, and my days always go together. Um, and actually one of my residents, optometry residents had seen her the week prior. Um, and the patient had actually come back in again. She was experiencing some more symptoms. But on her, her symptoms basically were, were, you know, flashes of light and floaters in the vision. Um, she's in her, you know, upper 50s and she's, you know, probably thinking after Googling it that she might be having a retinal detachment. So she comes in um, and I have to give props to, to our resident who actually graduated today. We're super excited for her. Uh, but she picked up on some really subtle findings on the fundus that she actually had mild anterior vitreous cell. Um, she had some small, you know, yellow kind of deep pigmented lesions in the retina of both eyes. Um, and she thought the nerve looked a little bit hot when she saw it. And so um, at that visit, they ended up doing testing, you know, an OCT of the retina. They did fluorescein angiography and ICG because um, at this point you're thinking of some kind of, you know, uveitis. And when I saw the patient again, the next time she actually looked fairly similar. I think she was just a little bit anxious about um, her condition, but all of her imaging was consistent with most likely birdshot chorioretinopathy. So um, the ICG was so cool. I mean, you, you look at the, the FA was too. So the fundus photos were very mild, you know, mild lesions that you could see on exam was a little bit more obvious, but then when you get the ICG out and at the end of the kind of towards the end, a little bit later into it, you see all these hypocyanescent dots just throughout the entire poster pole front, the periphery. Um, she had disc leakage in both eyes. She had large vessel leakage, so vasculitis, um, which is all consistent with the diagnosis. And, you know, she came in thinking it was a retinal detachment or something, and then, you know, ended up leaving with a totally different diagnosis. And that's something that, you know, as optometrists, we probably don't see a lot. And you have to really be looking for subtle signs. And so that was a pretty cool one. Um, still waiting on lab testing for her actually should be in the next couple of days. We should have some of that back. Um, so that was cool. There was another one. I mean, we've had a lot of like trauma cases lately. I had one that um, was coming in with uh, like, like proptosis. So the patient just notices, you know, my eye feels a little bit bigger, a little bit larger. Um, and it's red. Um, this is a, a case from, you know, a bit ago, but I'm, I'm trying to pull kind of fun ones. So she was coming in, she's in her forties and she had been diagnosed with an elevated eye pressure at an outside clinic. But when she came to us, it was more normal because they had put her on, I think, Timolol or Cosopt or something. Um, and then when you looked at her and they, I think had started her on steroids too, at some point for the redness of the eye. Um, but when you looked at her, 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 just around her eye looks more full. And I always tell, you know, my residents or anytime I give a lecture, make sure you take, you know, take the mask down, just sit back and look at them first, look at the face, look for asymmetry. Um, because a lot of times the mask just kind of covers up most of what we look for. And we just zoom in right to the eye. We forget about the rest of the head essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you really looked at her and you see that fullness, and then I had her turn her head up, and look up to the ceiling and you could see the proptosis of, of her eye. And it was the eye that was more injected. Um, and then after putting phenylephrine in, she still had these pretty good sized vessels that go all the way to the limbus. Um, and she had, you know, been diagnosed with high pressure on that side. But again, I was like, was that from the steroids or was it not? And we weren't really sure. But all of that stuff together was making me concerned for some kind of maybe AD malformation or fistula of some kind. Um, so we ended up doing imaging, got an MRA as well. And sure enough, she had a CC fistula, but I, it was really fairly subtle. I mean, you think about these like really proptotic eyes, super engorged, big, nasty vessels on the eye. And hers was more subtle than that. I think had she maybe, you know, there's a chance if she'd gone to an urgent care or something, they just keep giving her antibiotics, you know, for bacterial conjunctivitis or something. Um, we were like the third, the third place that she'd gone. So you know, and, and then she was whisked away. Basically, the next day, she was already having surgery. So um, just a lot of kind of crazy stuff. And you always have to be, I guess, prepared for for whatever comes in, you know? 
Allison, this this was awesome. It was so interesting to hear um, your practice setting and how you just like, you know, kind of every day you just walk in and you're like, I'm just going to tell you what's kind of thrown at me and we're going to make it work and make it happen. It's just so much different than what we typically see. And yeah, we, we have emergencies that come into the practice, but it's not the majority of the patients that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. I, two days ago, I said, boy, we, we, we had a really crazy day because we had three emergencies that came in and called into the office. I couldn't imagine the whole day being emergencies. So kudos to you. It just sounds like um, it truly does when you're describing all of this and, and your participation in it. You can just tell it's something that you enjoy doing. And, uh, and I think it's just awesome to have optometry represented in these areas of these regions. So, uh, so kudos yeah. to you and, 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 and doing that. Yeah, it's a awesome. lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being on the show. We truly appreciate it. I think this was absolutely awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's been, been fun to share what I do a little bit. And I still think add-ons for emergency are a little stressful. So that's what I did for three years. And I had a schedule and I'm like, okay, we got another one. We got another one. So I wouldn't discount that whatsoever. Um, you know, I go in knowing it's going to be crazy and not everybody does that. So it's a different mindset, but yeah, it's been um, it's been great, you know, getting to getting to talk with you again and and share a little bit about you know our ophthalmic ER. So yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you, Allison, and uh, thank you all for joining us on this episode of the Optometric Insight Show. Make sure you follow us, make sure you like us, and make sure you tune into our podcast for future episodes.